Wave Source Influencers video. Uh, I have with me Alan Yip, partner at Simmons & Simmons. Thank you for joining us, Alan. You're welcome. Now, before we be begin and start into the questions, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Give us some background. Sure. So, uh, I'm a lawyer. I'm a derivatives lawyer. Um, I, I act for asset managers, banks, and uh, corporates in relation to advising them on any kind of derivative matter, documentation, trading agreements, confirmations, prime brokerage agreements, but also in the past uh, six years or so, um, advising in relation to derivatives regulations as well. Perfect. Looking into 2016, Alan, what do you think is really the biggest challenge for your clients or for the industry at large? So um, unsurprisingly, uh, I would pick two things, I think in the context of EU derivatives regulation, um, and that will be the uh, onset of clearing for OTC derivatives. Um, and then I would also pick uh, the margin rules for uncleared derivatives, both of which are due to come into effect at some stage during 2016. So in relation to the clearing obligation, we're waiting, unlike in the US, we're still waiting for the clearing mandate to come in. That's expected any time now, um, but because of the various phase-ins, uh, for asset managers, large asset managers, that's likely to kick in probably around November or December 2016. Um, it, it depends uh, on, on the size of the fund and it also depends on the categorization that they fall within to, depending on how much derivatives they do. Um, that sounds like quite a long way away because that's at the end of next year, but actually before that the actual clearing mandate comes in, there's something called front loading. And what that means is that when the clearing obligation does eventually come in, let's say December time, you not only have to clear trades that you enter into after that time, but you've also got to go back and clear trades that you entered into before that time, but after a certain date called the front-loading date. And that front-loading date for certain funds is going to be only five months into 2016. So from about May or June time 2016, um, the larger funds that do lo lots of derivatives are going to be have to thinking about the fact that at some stage the trade they enter into at that stage on a bilateral basis will have to be cleared at some point in the future and that obviously affects things like documentation because you've got to think about what happens if it doesn't clear, the consequences of that and it may also affect things like pricing of that particular trade as well. Um, now the front loading and the timing of the phase in all depends on how the funds or counterparties are going to be categorized. It gets very complicated in terms of whether they're a, called a financial counterparty or a non-financial counterparty. If they're a non-financial counterparty, whether they're above or below certain thresholds, and if they are, a, bear with me, if they are a non-financial counterparty above the clearing thresholds, you've then got to decide whether there's something called category two or three, depending again on, on a different threshold. So as well as the actual obligations in relation to clearing themselves coming in in 2016, I think people are going to be having to grapple with all the different categorizations, having to categorize themselves, or indeed, if you're an asset manager and you've got external clients as well as your own sponsored funds, thinking about how you classify those clients, communicating with those clients, do they have the right information to be able to give you so you can categorize them. So there's quite a lot of lead time leading into this, even though the actual some of the obligations themselves don't actually arise until um, uh, later on in the year. So in short, quite a lot of work to do with a not work. a lot of time. That's right, a lot of work. Um, the second one are the margin rules. So the margin rules are the very first margin rules are just, uh, should be coming in in September 2016. Um, that will be the start again for the larger derivative users um, that there will be obligations in relation to variation margin and then in relation to posting of initial margin again there's going to be phase-ins uh, for the very largest uh, uh, players in the field it will be from 2016 but depending on on the amount of derivatives that are done it can be phased out uh, as, uh, as long away as 2020 and ultimately if if uh, if you're a if you're an entity that uh, does fewer than uh, 8 billion euros worth of derivatives you're not going to be subject to the initial margin rules at all Again, sounds like quite far away, but again, d depending on the categorization, it, it, um, you have to look uh, earlier in the year because in terms of categorization, you've got to look at your derivative positions 
um, in around March, April and May time. So there's still work to be done earlier in the year and that will then determine when, when the rules apply to you. And, and the rules themselves, which still haven't been finalised, even though it's, we're up against it now, um, go into a lot of detail about firstly the requirements in relation to procedurals, uh, timing and things like that, but also in, th in terms of things like eligibility, what collateral is eligible to be posted under the rules. Great. So we've talked about some of the challenges for 2016 already, and there's quite a few. Yeah. Um, and thanks for, for going into that detail there for, for both cleared and, and non-cleared. What do you believe will be the biggest development or a game changer even for 2016? Uh, yeah. Well, those two that I've talked about are the two that everybody knows about at some level or, or another, and they're expected. Um, I think there are a couple of other developments, as if those two weren't enough, there are a couple of other developments that uh, have flown under the radar that are going to affect um, participants in this field. Um, the first one I will pick is something called the Securities Financing Transaction Regulation, uh, SFTR for short. Uh, that's a new EU regulation that uh, not yet in force, likely to be in force January next year. Um, that imposes obligations in relation to reporting of uh, SFT, securities financing transactions. So repos, securities lending transactions will need to be reported to trade repositories, just in the same way as under EMEA and Dodd-Frank. Um, that, that one is, is, is uh, people who have gone through, have gone through the reporting rules already in relation to their EC derivatives. It's really an add-on to that. Um, there's a phase in for that, so there's probably not much in relation to that. Um, at the same time, under the same regulation, there are these rules that are going to be coming in in relation to collateral reuse. So any kind of collateral arrangement, whether under a repo, securities lending, or under an ISDA, or anything like that, or a prime brokerage agreement, uh, are going to be subject to these new requirements. And they will include certain disclosures, risk warnings that have to be exchanged uh, given by the party receiving the collateral to the other party. So that, that means not just from a bank counterparty to an asset manager, but also means from an asset manager to a bank counterparty, which seems a bit counterintuitive, but that's the way it goes. Um, and then lastly, in, in relation to that regulation, um, there are going to be new rules in relation to additional disclosure requirements for any um, uh, AFM, any uh, alternative investment fund manager who's authorised under AFMD, will be subject to new re disclosure requirements in their prospectus and in their annual report. Um, and there's going to be quite a lot of the detail about that. It's going to be things like details in relation to the repos and SEC lending that they do, as well as total return swaps. And the regulation sets out in quite a lot of detail the additional information that needs to be given to fund investors. Um, so, so that's one. The, the, uh, the other one I think that we're going to see um, midway through the year is, um, people may have already seen it from for the dealers, is the ISDA Resolution Stay Protocol. So, um, in a nutshell, this is all about um, the additional powers that the regulators have to step in when you have uh, a financial institution that's in trouble, and to be able to, rather than let it become bankrupt, to step in and try and resolve it, split good assets, bad assets, split it out into a bad bank or something like that. As part of those powers, um, the regulators are able to uh, effectively suspend counterparties' termination rights. So think if you're a counterparty to a defaulting bank, um, they default, they go into bankruptcy, uh, you would ordinarily terminate your agreement and take all the remedial action you're, you're entitled to take. But in this situation, the resolution authority would be able to effectively put the shutters down and say for a period of, let's say, 24 hours or 48 hours, Everybody take a breather, you can't do anything whilst the resolution authority takes its steps to separate the assets out. Um, so it's effectively a moratorium on termination rights. Those, those powers are actually already in effect. So in the UK, they were in effect from the beginning of January 2015. But there was always a concern from the regulators that those powers couldn't be enforced on a cross-border basis. So if you were if you were a, um, a Cayman hedge fund facing a UK broker-dealer entity under an ISDA transaction, and the ISDA was governed by New York law, let's say, um, 
there was a concern that even if the UK bank went into one of these resolutions and the UK regulator tried to impose uh, this, this moratorium, that, that wouldn't be enforceable because the agreement's governed by New York law and the counterparty is a Cayman hedge fund. So the answer to this was to ask ISDA to produce this uh, contractual remedy, which basically means getting people to contractually agree to effectively waive their termination rights in that kind of situation. Um, now, as between the largest banks, the regulators all put pressure on them and, and they, they signed up to that um, last year. Uh, now, it's, the regulators want to expand that to cover all counterparties, including the smaller banks and also including funds as well. And the way they're doing that, because if you're, if you're a counterparty facing a bank, you'd be asking yourself, why should I give up rights that I have and I get nothing in return, other than a pat on the back for good citizenship or something like that. Um, the, way, the way that that's being f effectively forced onto the end user community is by imposing new prudential rules on the banks themselves to say, after a certain period of a certain date, you cannot enter into any new trades with any counterparty unless they have agreed to contractually waive their rights. Um, now, in the UK, the, uh, the PRA, the Bank of England, have been consulting on their rules. And uh, in the consultation, they're talking about bringing that in in a phase period. So January 1st, 2016, is when it will start applying to some of the smaller banks. And then around July time is when it's going to start affecting um, asset management firms as well. So uh, we expect that uh, ISDA have been working on uh, the, the relevant documentation. Um, so I expect that in the first half of next year, people will start being asked to sign up to this kind of waiver by way of uh, contractual amendments. So, Alan, do you think people are aware of this change or this protocol? Um, no, generally no. When I speak to clients, there's a varying degrees of um, awareness of it. Some people have never heard of it at all, um, and some people have heard of it, but they thought it was for the banks, and they weren't aware that it's coming up to affect them as well. Um, so as it is something that, uh, in the UK at least, is going to be coming in in the first half of next year, um, I've certainly been going out and telling, telling, telling clients about it, trying to raise the awareness because um, it, it is going to be coming and people are going to be starting getting these requests from their, from their counterparties. Okay, perfect. Well, that's great information to share with our audience. Thank you for joining us in this video. You're welcome.